in view of several instances of economic offenders escaping the jurisdiction of Indian courts of law on account of the imminent initiation of criminal proceedings against them, or even during the pendency of such proceedings, an urgent need was felt by the government to bring them to book. The absenteeism of such offenders was not only obstructing investigation in criminal cases, but it was also leading to waste of valuable time of courts and denting the rule of law in India. Moreover, majority of these economic offenders were defaulters of bank loans, which was impairing the financial health of the banking sector in India. In the absence of the availability of effective civil and criminal provisions in law to deal with the gravity of the quandary, initially the Fugitive Economic Offenders Ordinance 2018 was promulgated in April 2018, followed by its enactment through the Parliament in July 2018 to ensure that fugitive economic offenders return to India to face the action in accordance with law. As India celebrates its journey of 75 years of independence, Sansa TV also contributes to the said glorious voyage by dedicating a fresh series titled 75 Years Laws That Shaped India. An exclusive program discussing and acclaiming different laws that have been introduced and adopted during these golden years. I'm your host, Hemant Batra, back with another episode in that series. Today, our focus will be on the Fugitive Economic Offenders Act 2018. In short, the FIO Act, a statute enacted to provide for measures to prevent fugitive economic offenders from evading the process of law in India by staying outside the jurisdiction of Indian courts. And a statute also enacted to preserve the sanctity of the rule of law in India. In this episode, we will discuss amongst other the legislative footprint for enacting the FIO Act, salient features of the FIO Act, the regulatory and adjudicating dispensation, drawbacks in relation to its application, and significant judicial precedents. Let us begin with the legislative trail of this Act. The Fugitive Economic Offenders Bill 2018 was introduced in the Lok Sabha on 12th of March 2018. As the said bill could not be taken up for consideration and passing in the Lok Sabha and as the circumstances existing then necessitated immediate action, the President of India in exercise of the powers conferred by Clause 1 of Article 123 of the Constitution promulgated the Fugitive Economic Offenders Ordinance 2018 with effect from 21st of April 2018. Subsequently, the Fugitive Economic Offenders Bill 2018 was debated and passed in the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha on 19 July 2018 and 25 July 2018 respectively. The said bill received assent of the President of India on 31st July 2018. However, the Fugitive Economic Offenders Act 2018 was deemed to have come into force on the 21st day of April 2018. Let us view and hear some of the significant debates in the Parliament on the said Act. I rise to move for leave to introduce a bill to provide for measure to, de to deter uh, fugitive economic offenders from avoiding the pr process of law in India by staying outside the jurisdiction of Indian court. It lacks teeth to deal with fugitives. We have multitude of laws like PMLA, like Surfacy, like IBC to deal with white collar crimes. Why do we need another law? Koi bhi bhagora. जो बैंक को लूट करके भागा हो 
या किसी भी वित्तीय संस्थान को लूट करके भागा हो या वास्तव में देश का लुटेरा है उसको या आकाश में हो या पताल में या देश में हो या विदेश में उसको पकड़ करके लाया जाएगा और निश्चित रूप से एक एक पाय वसूल करके गरीबों को और किसानों को देश के खुशहाली के लिए खर्च किया जाएगा कुछ माननीय सांसदों ने दबी जबान से समर्थन दिया लेकिन ये अच्छी बात है कि किसी ने भी इसका विरोध नहीं किया सौ करोड़ से ज्यादा जो पैसा लेके भागेगा उसके ऊपर ये कानून लागू हो मैं सिर्फ मंत्री जी से यही निवेदन करूंगा कि अगर इस देश का कोई एक रुपया भी लेकर भागता है कानून सबके लिए बराबर होना चाहिए सेक्शन फोर्टीन विच सीम्स टू बी अंसर्न फॉर एवरीबडी that it says in a on declaration of an individual as a fugitive economic offender any court or tribunal in india in any civil proceedings before it may disallow any individual from putting forward or defending any civil claims sir now if this goes into international court where the fugitive is abroad so now if he is going to get a battery of lawyers abroad who are exceptionally good at international laws does this stand in international law it's not a question of bill it's a question of will this government clearly lacks a political will to strongly deal with fugitive economic uh, offenders and also to fight corruption and loot of the country sir i move that the bill as amended be passed the question is that the bill as amended be passed those in favor may say aye those against may say no i think the ayes have it the ayes have it the motion is adopted and the bill is as amended is passed Since decades there was a mounting concern to aggressively deal with and target high value white collar criminals with help of some powerful investigative mechanism and if not coercive at least armed strongly armed legal administration in the same way as one would counter and respond to a mafia a gang of rogues and drug cartels So here we are today discussing the Fugitive Economic Offenders Act 2018 the FEO Act to talk on this breakthrough legislation we have with us a very powerful proficient and scholarly panel we have with us justice rajiv sahai and law he is former judge of the delhi high court as a judge he has delivered some outstanding and remarkable judgments Welcome, Justice Anlo. Thank you. Thank you, man. It's truly our pleasure to have you with us. <laughs> Thank you for having me over. Thank Thanks. And we also have amongst us, Mr. P. K. Dash, a highly accomplished IRS officer, former member of the highest direct tax body, the CBDT, the Central Board of Direct Taxes. Welcome, Mr. Dash. Thank you studio. for having me here. So let's begin our discussion. Yes, please. For today. Uh, let me start with you, Justice Anlo. Yes, please. Uh, Justice Anlo, there already are series of laws dealing with uh, fiscal offences. You know, we have Prevention of Money Laundering Act, we have Black Money Act, we have Benami uh, Transactions, Properties Transactions Act, and even Indian Penal Code has several sections and provisions dealing with economic offences. Yes, but none of these laws. deal with high value white collar criminals or crimes so in that context you know i would like you to share with our viewers how would you describe the fugitive economic offenders act 2018 as to its efficacy and, and significance see hemant uh, the purpose of making a law is to regulate human behavior and human conduct and uh, wherever the legislature or the lawmaker finds that a particular act done by an individual or a corporate amounts to an offence or an offence against the society by law that is declared as an offence the value really or who has committed the offence or against the whom against whom offence is committed is not relevant as far as the law making offences are concerned and since law making is a process which takes considerable time and laws cannot be made every day 
laws have always been interpreted by the courts as living statutes. That is, uh, a law, IPC was made, for instance, more than 100 years back, the Indian Penal Code. 1860, yes. The human conduct, the way the crimes are done, the way the investigation is done, same about Criminal Procedure Code. That is slightly later, but yes. again, more than 50 years old. So, the laws are uh, interpreted as an organic statute, that is a living statute, to cover whatever eventuality. So, the interpretation which is given is to maybe cover the situations which arise with the changing time, with the changing human behavior and with the changing technology. But at times it is felt by the legislature that uh, the language of the statute does not enable a particular situation to be dealt with. So, the, if I may put it in my words, the, uh, it's always a cat and mouse game between the lawmaker, the law enforcer and the law violator on the other hand. Exactly. So, when it was felt, my take on this Economic uh, Offenders Act, FIO Act is that uh, it was felt that uh, the existing laws were not enough to suitably punish or more importantly to, you know, the uh, fugitive economic offenders who uh, means who have left the country right. to confiscate their property because what was found was that on the one hand, they were sitting outside, they were refusing to come to India right. or not wanting to come to India in spite of having amassed yeah. wealth by wrongful means from India. Yeah. And on the other hand, they were continuing to enjoy the fruits of that, uh, yeah. the, the illegal acts or the offenses yeah. which they had uh, committed. An attempt was made under the PMLA Act to confiscate those properties, but it was not felt to be enough. Right. Only certain properties which could be linked to the particular crime could be taken, uh, confiscated, and that was also taking a very long time. So, few is that way a uh, change to be able to uh, enable the law enforcers to uh, confiscate the prop properties of such people right. more effectively and ultimately to compel them to come back. Yes. Because if uh, the, the thought, according to uh, my reading of this statute, is the thought is that if you take away what they have amassed over here, right. then maybe they'll come back. Or even if they come back, at least what has been taken away from the society can be yes. given to the society. Right. Having said that, I, I may just add one thing that there is some ambiguity that how that, what the sale proceeds, how they are to be used. Yes, that's, that's a question, or, obviously, yes. I have to ask but, you specifically. But uh, I'm sure as well. uh, that question will also be answered over the years. Yes. It's a baby statute, right? barely three years old, yes. so yes. a lot of work is to happen yeah. in the courts in it. Right, so in that Thank sense, you. it is an innovative law because it fills up uh, you know, some of the gaps which were kind of uh, or left out. So it, in that sense, it does take care of those gray areas. Yes, the lacunas which uh, were found in the earlier laws right. and which were not enabling certain properties to be taken over in spite of a strong case right. of the properties belonging to them. Right. This was the idea behind it. Right. Right. Uh, Mr. Dash, uh, how would you like to complement and commend this statute in context of today's times? And, and I'm sure your experience as a, a member of one of the highest uh, authority in the direct tax regime would, would come handy in, 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 in uh, explaining to the viewers. Yeah, Hemanji, this, uh, this law is a landmark law and we must understand the background in which this law was enacted. First it came as ordinance and then it, was, it became yes. law. Yes. And uh, the background is that it is a time when many people evaded the tax or evaded the committed fraud or uh, committed crime mm -hmm. and they escaped from the country right? because with the globalization and uh, internationalization of the economy, the, it is very easy to mm -hmm. escape from the country mm -hmm. and one commits crime and escapes and mm -hmm. doesn't submit to the courts of India. Mm -hmm. There is a wise saying I am reminded, it says that no one can outrun the long arm of the law. <laughs> so the this law, this FIO Act is uh, necessary 
because the other acts which are there, it was taking long time and it was not able to coerce the escapees to submit to the jurisdiction of Indian courts. Yeah. I will just give you a few examples. Like, for example, uh, there is Extradition Act, which we'll be discussing yes. in the course of the... Uh, 1962 debate. Act. Yeah. Yes. So, in the extradition, for example, I will take a case of David Hadley. This Extradition Act becomes effective only after a long procedure being followed by the... Because it is subject to international treaties. Right. So, international treaty... It, it recognizes internationally acclaimed principles of jurisprudence, which right. is very difficult to comply with. Mm -hmm. For example, in David Hadley case, the American court did not submit him to Indian jurisdiction because mm -hmm. it said the ge dual geopardy. Mm -hmm. He was already subjected to crime of murder case of six Americans in America. And uh, that is why. So the Indian courts order that he should be extradited, it was not agreed by the same has happened in case of uh, uh, our liquor bar and Vijay Malia. Mm. The human rights, it is not only the legal issues <coughs> and extradition, mm. the human rights also come into play. Mm. He has claimed, he has argued there in the court that the condition of the courts, the, the jails in India are bad. Mm. So the UK courts mm. have uh, ordered mm. that the Arthur, Raid, Arthur Road uh, jail, in, a in video should be submitted Bombay. before the UK court, yes. whether they are under proper human, human conditions, right. that human rights are being violated or not. Mm -hmm. So there are several other issues, mm -hmm. like in Abu Shalem case also. Mm -hmm. It happened that it was, he was uh, made fugitive in a special crime. Mm -hmm. And after coming to, uh, after extradition, some additional grounds were added, mm -hmm. which Portugal government did not like. Because mm -hmm. if the speciality case, that if you are charged for a particular crime, and you are made fugitive, and mm -hmm. you have been surrendered, then you can be tried only for that crime. Right. So as you know, in course of the investigation, few other crimes come to knowledge. Right. You can't add on. Yeah. So these are the limitations that both human rights, legal issues, and also bilateral relations, yeah. they also come into play while extraditing the uh, yeah. offenders to the country uh, in India. Absolutely. Yeah, so despite this new law having been there now, still those practical uh, barricades continue to exist. Uh, yeah, this, this law is, uh, is another, it's an intelligent uh, method they have followed. This, I should say it is intelligent because it says, even if you don't come, we are going to seize not your only properties. your proceeds of crime, not only your, your proceeds, proceeds of, of crime, crime, entire property that you own in India Absolutely. and also in foreign country. Right. We can attach those property, your entire property, not only in India, not only proceeds of crime, all other crime, all properties and also your property outside the country if you don't submit within 90 days of the order of the special court. So, so therefore, the, those practical issues or difficulties which existed in the past have in a way been overcome by this new act in a roundabout way. Hemanji, I will say a person commits a crime with an objective. The objective is to get undue riches, undue uh, assets. Yes. Now, economy, as you know, the purse, I have worked in tax department, Always, I know uh, the, the purse of the person, if you <laughs> cut the purse of the person, he is hit badly. Yes. So this law uh, aims at hitting him badly through attaching and... Uh, economically penalizing, may yeah. not be physically, economically yeah. penalizing. penalizing. So that he is forced to come and submit to the jurisdiction. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, Justice Enlo, uh, now diving into the substantive part of the discussion, uh, let's, let's discuss the... The, uh, the real provisions of the Act. As you were mentioning and as Mr. Dash also men mentioned, the, the main thrust of the statute is to attach properties, to confiscate properties and then to manage properties. Yes. And, and in a way, you know, try to bring back the, the fugitive economic offender, but predominantly to, to attach and confiscate the properties. So everything boils down to who is this fugitive economic offender under, under the Act? Who is, how do you label a person as, as a fugitive economic offender? See, the statute has uh, laid down a criteria of uh, any person against whom the special court under the uh, Prevention of Money Laundering Act has issued a warrant with respect to an offence which is listed in the schedule. So there are a large number of offences. If we 
hey, there is no point in going into individual offenses because it's a long list. These are offenses largely affecting the society. That seems to be the spirit which is running into it that somebody has defrauded the masses, somebody has uh, defrauded the bank, somebody has defrauded the tax authorities or shareholders. That is the spirit which runs through the act. Now, the good thing which they have done is that they have uh, laid down a monetary criteria right. that uh, where the value is more than 100 crores. In my personal view, seeing the kind of offenses these days, 100 crores may still bring in a lot of uh, people into the net. And what has been experienced is that uh, if you bring it a very large catch, then maybe the implementation becomes. And once the spirit implementation becomes tardy, once the spirit of the statute is that it should be the large offenders, mm. my uh, opinion is that that should be reviewed from time to time. Mm. Today they have started with 100 crores. If it is found that it's uh, involving a lot of people and it may not be worthwhile and it is resulting in effective steps not being taken, mm. then uh, mm, uh, that should be increased from time to time. So it's not as if the law enforcers are uh, entitled to just declare anybody. You have to make an application. There are grounds specified what has to be satisfied. If you satisfy that, notice of that ap application will be issued to the person who is sought to be declared as a fugitive economic uh, offender. And then after hearing, the court passes an order. That whether it so is it's, it's to a be judicial declared. declaration. So it's, it's, it's not a executive. judicial declaration, and uh, there is an appeal provision uh -huh. because since these uh, courts are notified at the session level, right. there is a provision for appeal. I so see. you are entitled to agitate that no, I am not liable to be declared. Lie? Sorry to interject. Where, where appeal to the high court. Appeal, appeal lies will lie high to court. the concerned high court. Right. So an appeal uh, can be on, on, has to be on the on the legal uh, infirmities or even. Factual Appeal is quite uh, largely worded. Largely worded. Yes, and even where what we have found is that it is provided that on a substantial question of law, right. the courts have interpreted those terms fairly yes. widely and they have said that if uh, the question of law and a question of fact are interrelated, then... Interrelated, yes. And uh, this is, uh, to a certain extent, a penal statute, so the benefit, whatever is given, of wider... Uh, interpretation of penal statute, strict interpretation, right. wherever the, um, there is any ambiguity, the benefit going to the yeah. accused, all those provisions will apply. Def so it's uh, not something which has been left to the authorities, authorities. or to the executive. So it is a judicial declaration right. which is required to be. And then, of course, once the declaration is made, the consequences flow, uh, follow about con attachment, confiscation of the property of and properties all. and all that. Yes. So, well, yeah, even, uh, you know, I had glanced through the statute and, and I understand that, you know, the process of uh, declaring an offender as a fugitive economic offender, yes. this process is much more uh, efficacious and fast if one was to compare it with the procedure which is there under CRPC for a for declaring yeah. a proclaimed, proclaimed offender. offender yes. So, in, in that sense, this process, this is a modern law. At the end yes. of the day. See, the proof of any statute is in uh, its implementation. I implementation. And how that it plays correct. out. How it and plays all out. of us are lawyers. Right. And uh, we can be very... Yes. Uh, this thing that uh, we'll come up with innovative arguments. Right. To defeat the statute. Right. And of course, the law officers of the country yes. would be <laughs> <laughs> attempting to have the statute enforced. Statute, yeah. But eventually, as it the, is the significant point what you have made uh, is with regard to the uh, the implementation part. Eventually, no matter how many words you put in in a, in a statute, That's right. the, the whole uh, uh, desirability as to attainment of its objective lies in its implementation. That's right. So That's the, the, the law enforcers have to be very, very careful that when they make an application, yes. they comply with all the requirements which right. are, they prevent sufficient... Uh, they, they present sufficient evidence before the court yes. and uh, that evidence is procured in the manner in which it is provided under the statute. Yes. So that technicalities don't come in the way. In the way. And at the same time, nobody else is harassed. Somebody yes. uh, who is not liable to be declared 
yes. should not be declared. Right. But as per data available online, 90 banks, 90, 90 banks and financial institutions reported a total of 45,613 cases of financial fraud till 31st March 2021. In March 2018, roundabout time when this FIO Act was to be passed, the Ministry of External Affairs revealed that over 30 people accused of various financial scams and frauds and under probes by the Enforcement Directorate and CBI etc. were absconding from India. The FIO Act has been in much limelight and news since its inception. Surely because it deals with the infamous group of high-profile, wealthy, white-collared criminals, the so-called celebrity defaulters, who just abandoned the country to avoid their prosecution. Let us return to our substantive discussion and recap some of the key provisions of the FIO Act. Section 2, Clause F of the FEO Act defines fugitive economic offender as any individual against whom a warrant for arrest in relation to a scheduled offence has been issued by any court in India who has left India so as to avoid criminal prosecution or being abroad refuses to return to India to face criminal prosecution. Section 2, Clause M of the FEO Act defines scheduled offence as an offence specified in the schedule if the total value involved in such offence or offences is 100 crore rupees or more. The FEO Act provides for an elaborate list of offences under its schedule. The schedule refers to 15 statutes and laws such as the Indian Penal Code, the Negotiable Instruments Act, the Reserve Bank of India Act, the Prevention of the Money Laundering Act, the Black Money Act, the Prevention of Corruption Act, the Companies Act and many more. Each law in turn stipulates a set of selective sections in that schedule, a violation of which will be regarded as a scheduled offence. Let us move forward with our discussion. Uh, coming on to you, uh, Mr. Dash, as uh, Justice Endlo had pointed out that the statute is, is new, and it's, it's very neat and very concise and brief. I mean, it has, what, three chapters and 26 sections. And each chapter deals with a specific set of provisions. Chapter 2 is, is the most significant one as it deals with attachment of properties, confiscation of properties, declaration of, of a fugitive economic offender, and, and then management of, of the properties. Could you please tell our viewers what is the procedure which is followed uh, in respect of attachment of properties? Because I gather that the officers concerned have sweeping powers in respect of attachment of properties, including pre-conviction and pre-declaration uh, attachment. Yeah, Hemanji, uh, as you have already said, that uh, under CRPC, yes. the proclaimed offender, it took... It takes a lot of time and uh, evidences to declare somebody for provisional attachment of the proceeds of the crime. Under FIO Act, it has been made very simple. The I Directorate see. of Enforcement has got broad spectrum of power. Right. Once a fellow is charged, they are seated under the scheduled offence, under any law, that laws... Yeah, which, which, which are the, given in the schedule. In the schedule. Yes. Then... The and plus, the, where the value involved is, is 100 crores. More than 100 crores. And above, yes. Then the director, along with that charge sheet and his evidence of going abroad, he is not available in the court and uh, not right. responding. Right. So with that, he submits the papers to the court. Uh, without the permission of the court, he can attach the properties as well. Right. Now, in, there are other laws also, like Prevention of Money Laundering Act, where the provisional attachment is there. But after the attachment, it goes to adjudicating authority and then it goes to long procedure is followed. Here it is certain the, once the application is made, the director can uh, directly file the case to the special court mm -hmm. for the purpose. And the court, uh, 
uh, of course, he, there is a limitation that within 30 days he has to file the case within the special court. 30 days of attachment, he has to file the case I see. within the court. So, within, so once the provisional attachment is done, within 30 days from that attachment, he has to file the case in the court. File the, and uh, after filing the case, the court has to hear and within 180 days, right. the court has to uh, take a decision whether he is a fugitive or not. Right. And once he decides, the court declares him as a fugitive. Right. Uh, then 90 days time is given right. that he may go in appeal, the person may go in appeal oh, in see. any court. I see. Here an interesting point is that, right. contrast to CRPC, right. that the onus lies on the offender to prove that he is not a fugitive. I see. Here the offender himself has to prove that he is not a, not a fugitive. I see. So, the procedure, the burden of proof is simple. Same as PMLA. PMLA also has by and large. To some extent, to it some is extent, same, yes. but here it is more rigorous Mo, uh, than PMLA because the director can attach all properties. In PMLA, he can attach only the properties which are directly or indirectly linked with the, linked with proceeds, the, with of the, the crime. proceeds of the crime. But here, I he see. can uh, attach all properties including his clean properties, right. his inherited properties as well, right. his entire property, both here and outside India also. He can attach those properties. And uh, uh, in PMLA, after attachment, confiscation takes long time. Here, right. the confiscation will be very fast. And uh, once the court declares that he is a fugitive, within 90 days, the right. property right will be vested in the central government right. and they will free of any income runs. Right. So, so confiscation, uh, sorry to interject you. So, confiscation will be done by the court, or special court. No, no, no like the attachment is, is done by the officer. Yeah. Confiscation is done by the order of the court. Court, yeah. By the order of the court, court yeah. And confiscation would obviously happen after the uh, offender is declared as a fugitive. fugitive. Yeah. That's so it. that is that is the that scheme. Is, that is the scheme. Uh, right. Yeah. And uh, uh, only thing is that the if any third party has the right over the property, right. then the is the owners is on the uh, third party to, to prove that, that it is bona fide, that he has a right over the property. Yeah. And uh, that is the only… Uh, and bona fide uh, meaning that uh, that party was not aware that it was part of the proceeds of crime. Proceeds. And, so and, so and so within so. 90 days, he has to make a claim that this is my property. I am a bona fide owner. And, what, what, and that application or request has to be made at what stage? Before the court or after attachment, uh, he can make this even before the Directorate of Enforcement as well as in before the court. Before the, and right. even the court doesn't agree, after that he can go to appeal also. Uh, Justice uh, and law, uh, Section 15 yes. is also very significant, which uh, Mr. P.K. Dash had touched briefly yes. with regard to management of properties. Yes. You know, the management of properties are taken over by the government and government have enormous powers with regard to even disposing of the uh, proceeds of crime, the, or the, let's say the properties. Yes. Now, how do they deal with the claims of uh, creditors and, and, and claimants, uh, you know, at that stage? Of, of when, when you have actually uh, received sale proceeds, I'm, I'm not talking at the stage where the property is only confiscated. I'm, I'm talking of the stage when the disposal has happened and the sale proceeds have reached the government. Yes. See, the rules are uh, have to deal with it. They are not there as Hello. yet. Yes, so there is some ambiguity that how it will be dealt with. Yes. But uh, considering the purpose and the spirit of the statute, ordinarily it should come back to the society. And even otherwise, if it goes to the Consolidated Fund of India, it is coming back right. to the society. Right. One thing uh, lurks in my mind about this because see, here we are confiscating the property uh, merely at the because he is a fugitive and because a warrant has been issued against him. Yes. There is no conviction as yet. Right. So that question is also likely to arise in the court that uh, what happens in a case if ultimately he is not convicted. You yes. have, though he has chosen not to come back to the country. Right. But at the same time, he is acquitted in that But court. that time, the assets will get extinguished. That's right. So, all these questions… Whereas under will... CRPC, sorry to interject you, they, it, they, there is a period of two years. Yes. Cooling period, I would say. You yes. Know? But here, it's very sort of instant. Yes. You know. So, the whole uh, purpose of the statute, as uh, Mr. Dash also uh, has said, is to bring the person back, back 
and face trial, face the law. Yes. And uh, it's only by way of uh, uh, this thing that, okay, if you don't come back, then we'll do right. this. Just then, no, sorry maybe. to uh, interrupt you, but yes. then, uh, as we are discussing 15, you know, I want to take a, a, yes. uh, a small yes. step I'm backward. I'm sorry, 15 got left behind. Yeah, no, no, 15, yeah, you I have already touched. Yeah. 14, I wanted yes. you to yes. uh, touch upon. You know, 14 is, is a very uh, uh, sort of nagging section, to say so, yes. because it disallows, uh, you know, legal claims. Uh, no, but a, if we have a look at 14, yes, 14, yeah, I'm it talking says about that on a declaration of an individual as a FEO, yeah, any court or tribunal in yes. India in any civil proceeding, civil proceeding, it, yes, may disallow, may disallow. See, uh, till now, what we have seen is that uh, if there is a proceeding for attachment of a property in yes. one court, somebody will file a suit for declaration in a civil court, also from that saying oh, that uh, this is my property, so it has been wrongly attached, right. And uh, all that process was taking a very long time. Oh. So the idea is that, all right, if you have any claim, you go back to the special court special, only I see. for adjudication. There should not be any overlap or multiplicity. There should not be any, uh, you should not uh, play that game oh. that you go to the court and say, look, there is a stay order from uh, uh, district court somewhere far away. Right. And then the government was left or the enforcement agencies were left to go and uh, fight out that case over there. Right. And the civil court will naturally be guided by entirely different considerations under the civil procedure code. So it would have led to the purpose of the statute being, being defeated. defeated. So, uh, right. so this yes. section was essential in my view to give effect to the purpose which was sought to be served. Under this Whether act. the purpose is right or not, confiscation before conviction. Right. That... Uh, is something which we have yeah. to see. So, it, in, in a way, I mean, it does not go against the spirit of Article uh, 21 and 14 of the Constitution of India, as some experts had aired that view. But I, I think your view appears to be much more valid to me personally. That you know, otherwise, the whole purpose of this act would would sort of get diluted. Yes. You know, if people would start doing uh, uh, forum shopping in a, in a way. And that is what we have seen happening mm, in the uh, past. So yeah, absolutely. I'm sure it's been done by right. the lawmakers from past experience. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we will have to slip into a very short break. Please don't go anywhere as we'll be back soon. Welcome back after the break. You're watching our special show on 75 years of legislative journey. Today we are discussing a highly significant law passed by the parliament to keep up with the changing times. We are talking about the Fugitive Economic Offenders Act 2018. As the offenders take shelter in so-called safe heavens and hide the proceeds of crime in intricate legal structures over diverse international jurisdictions, the disparities and ambiguities of international cooperation in this regard are abundantly exploited by them, obviously to their benefit and advantage. This is a fundamental impediment in the path of this law's desired implementation. Before getting back to our discussion with the panelists on this very issue, let us have a look at India's strong, sincere and candid commitment regarding action against fugitive economic offenders. Banks' ki resolution and recovery is better. Ho rahi hai. बैंकों की स्थिति मजबूत हो रही है और एक इनहेरेंट स्ट्रेंथ उसके भीतर पाई जा रही है सरकार ने जिस पारदर्शिता और प्रतिबद्धता के साथ काम किया है उसका एक प्रतिबिंब बैंकों को वापस मिली राशि भी है हमारे देश में 
जब बैंकों से कोई उठा के भाग जाता है तो चर्चा बहुत होती है लेकिन कोई दम वाली सरकार वापस लाती है तो इस देश में कोई चर्चा नहीं करता है पहले की सरकारों के समय जो लाखों करोड़ रुपए फंसाए गए थे उनमें से पांच लाख करोड़ रुपए से अधिक की रिकवरी की जा चुकी है इंडिया अर्निस्ट प्लेट सीकिंग एक्शन अगेंस्ट फ्यूजिटिव इकोनॉमिक ऑफेंडर्स एंड एसेट रिकवरी एट द ग्लोबल लेवल इज क्लियरली प्रूव एंड मैनिफेस्टेड बाय द प्रेजेंटेशन ऑफ अ नाइन पॉइंट एजेंडा टू जी ट्वेंटी कंट्रीज बाय द इंडियन प्राइम मिनिस्टर नरेंद्र मोदी ऑन नवंबर थर्टी एंड फर्स्ट डिसम्बर ट्वेंटी एटीन एट जी ट्वेंटी समिट ऑन international finance and tax systems in the said summit amongst other matters india called for a strong and active cooperation from the g20 nations to deal comprehensively and efficiently with the menace of fugitive economic offenders cooperation in the legal processes such as effective freezing of the proceeds of crime early extradition of offenders and efficient repatriation of the proceeds of crime to form a mechanism to bar entry and safe havens to all fugitive economic offenders fully and effective implementing the principles of the united nations convention against corruption and united nations convention against transnational organized crime particularly linked to international cooperation India also suggested to considering initiate working on locating properties of economic offenders who have tax debts in the country of their residence for its recovery and few more such agenda items were suggested by the prime minister on behalf of India This is an important challenge as we were discussing right at the beginning of the uh, episode Uh, right at the threshold uh, mr uh, pk dash uh, you know the the act has a specific provision with regard to foreign assets and sending letter of request to the contracting states to the foreign countries uh, with the help of the special court but still recovery of proceeds of crime from cross border and securing presence of these fugitives has been a has been a task has been a challenge in a way what is your assessment and view with regard to lack of success in seeking extradition of these fugitive economic offenders hemant ji this uh, extradition laws they are governed by not only the international treaties they adopt the internationally acclaimed principles of justice right so the level of uh, witness and evidences are very strict for example they are not only legal issues but sometimes they go beyond legal extra legal issues for example bilateral relations between both the countries mm -hmm. the standing of the fugitive in that country there are issues like uh, the duality of the crime it may be a crime in our country it may not be a crime in that country the uh, the issue of speciality clause so these are the several issues which govern and the human rights issue for example what is the uh, under trial uh, uh, treatment of under trial in in the country which, which you were mentioning uh, which uk has taken up this case because in europe particularly europe they have high standards of human rights so if any violation they will have to uh, they have to take steps against that so that is why extradition treaties take not only very long time it is very expensive also as you know in international courts the trial is very expensive both mm -hmm. the litigation and others as very expensive and it takes a lot of time and appeal and all so uh, there is no way how to secure the presence of that fugitive in the country and submit him to the jurisdiction of the indian courts mm -hmm. so the law will force now indirectly yes. that if you don't submit within such and such date you are declared a fugitive and all your properties in india even if it they are not proceeds of crime the entire property will be confiscated there is a difference between attachment and confiscation here yeah. attachment is only you are stopped from extinguishing the right over the property right. confiscation means the property becomes the state property the day it is declared as 
confiscated. Right. Right. And there is no encumbrance on the property. Right. The state can deal any way it likes. Right. Right. So this is the difference and it will become first to confiscate any property. Right. Here there is another issue like you are raising uh, that the civil claims, there is an issue there. For example, in a company or in a limited liability partnership, Yes. Suppose the managerial personal is a fugitive, declared as a fugitive. Yeah. He now the company or the, that firm will be debarred from any civil claim over that property. So that is, is again an extra shoulder extra, which has been given to the authorities. Shoulder, and yes. uh, that needs to be tr seen in the court, how the courts see it. Right. That. So this, this so it's enough, I feel, you know, because it is quite coercive in, in, in that sense, uh, you know, whether we are able to secure the uh, presence of these offenders uh, before the courts of law. Fact is that uh, it is also marring their standing and their credibility globally because today we are living in a global village in that sense. So if they are declared as fugitive economic offenders in this nation, in a way it affects their standing globally You know, because if they were to seek any fiscal assistance in any other part of the world as well because the KYC is quite intertwined in, in today's time. So you, that's a very uh, good point what you have made that uh, the, the, the principal objective is to basically throttle them economically. Yeah. You know, in that sense. Uh, Justice Andlaw, uh, final question to you. Yes. Uh, this act, as you said, it's a baby act. It's, it's just over three years old. But no matter how young a law is, one could always look at gray areas in, yes. in a particular law and, and there could be some changes expected at this stage now or, or some amendments. Do you think that this law needs some changes uh, in, in today's context? It's too early, Hemant, hey, to right. talk in terms of change. We have to see how the act plays itself out. There have been very few uh, court proceedings. Absolutely. Uh, with respect to it, and I'm sure uh, with this kind of a statute, right. there will be uh, maybe some changes are required. It all depends upon how the courts have a look at it. Right. Because, uh, see, it's very peculiar. I, I repeat myself that you are not convicting a person. Yes. You are, uh, the, the only test is, has a warrant been issued? Now, if the warrant has been rightly or wrongly issued, that right. you have to do in the... That is outside the jurisdiction yes. of this act. Yeah, that's under that's the scheduled offence. That's not the offense. domain. That's, yes. that's with respect to the uh, special court. That yes. you have to say. And if you have feel that it has been wrongly issued by that court, you can challenge it right. in the higher courts. But what for this act they are required to see only is that yes, warrant has been issued. This is your property. And it is attached. It is attached. So the whole idea is, it's yes. a deterrent. It's a deterrent statute. Absolutely. It's a deterrent all right, statute. If you yes. feel that you will amass wealth and then you will avoid the law by sitting in a foreign jurisdiction, we'll take away your property. Yes. That is the only purpose. And otherwise, if you want to come and you want to contest the criminal action mm. against you, the warrant which has been mm. issued against you, then yes, uh, all this does not apply. Right. Right. That was yes. <laughs> so that's, so that's why well uh, yes. Mr. Dash mentioned about uh, owners and all. See, when we go about uh, determining rights with respect to property in the civil court, right. the test of preponderance of probability yes. applies, not the test of beyond reasonable doubt yes. as applies for convicting anyone. Right. So for that reason, they have applied the test of preponderance of probability to determine whether the property is yes. of the accused. Right. Uh, uh, still a accused. He is not a convict. Right. Yes. It's time to take the viewer's question. This time the question has come from Priya Mishra from Delhi. I would like to ask you a question. What is mean by the provisions contained under section 16, subsection 3 of the Act that the standard of proof applicable to the determination of fact by the special court shall be preponderance of priorities? Thank you. Uh, I think this has troubled a lot of people because uh, this is seen as a criminal statute and in criminal statute uh, we have normally the test of beyond reasonable doubt. The test of preponderance of probabilities has been applied in this case 
Because see, what is the uh, court required to determine at the time of declaration? The only two tests are that he is a uh, economic offender. Now, if uh, fugitive economic offender, the fact that warrant has been issued to him is enough to declare him, and the fact that he is away from the country, he is refusing to country, is enough. So these are some things which don't require much proof. The only other thing is that the property which is sought to be attached and confiscated is the property which is the proceed of the crime. That can have some repercussion with respect to the change of the uh, uh, burden of proof. But otherwise that the property belongs to the accused, that whenever there is a civil dispute with respect to the property, we always apply the test of preponderance of probability. So perhaps for that reason, this test has been applied and I don't see any reason why the test of beyond reasonable doubt was required for this determination. Well, by and large, the Fugitive Economic Offenders Act 2018 has addressed several crucial inadequacies of the past. But still, every law must constantly evolve because finding security in static law is totally unfounded. On that note, we come to the conclusion of this episode. Thank you so much for sharing your expert views. Thank you. And Thanks giving deep you. insight into the statute. Thank you. Well, that's all we have in this edition of the program. You can send your feedback at Sansad TV at sansad.nic.in. You can also connect with us on various other social media platforms. Thank you for watching. Goodbye, good luck and stay safe.